morning. Good morning. Hey, y'all. I'm so glad to meet y'all. Um, my name is Lisa Tuck. So you've been getting emails from me. So, yay. <laughs> Gosh, this is it's so great to see you. It's just so great to see you. I'm so excited that we're starting today. Okay, so the first thing on our agenda is just an introduction to the Master Naturalist program. I'll tell y'all my story about how I got into it. Um, I had moved, I lived in Dickinson for years in North Galveston County and then moved to Huntsville and decided I wanted to become a master gardener. So I, but I was still working full time in Houston and I had Googled it and I you know, got signed up for the master gardener program because my job was flexible enough that I could do it. Even though their classes were on Thursdays, I could work from home that day. And so anyway, and then right as I was about to start uh, my job, my boss changed. And so my flexibility changed. And so that didn't happen. But anyway, meanwhile, um, when I was looking up Master Gardener, this Master Naturalist thing popped up. And I'm going, what is that? And um, so anyway, I looked at that and I thought, oh my gosh, I love that because it's holistic. It's holistic. And, um, and then I found out that the one that included Walker County met on Saturday. And I'm going, <laughs> it's a sign. It's a sign because I was still working full time, but I could do this on Saturdays. Uh, I'll tell you, when you live in Huntsville, work in Houston, and are down there five days a week and do it and on Saturdays, it was a little tough. I almost killed myself doing it. But um, I, I just, I love it. I love everything about it. And I do love it that it's holistic because you may get a plant person like me. You may get somebody who's into herpetology. You may get someone who's into herpetology but specializes in lizards. Uh, you'll get a bat person, you'll get um, uh, this person or that person or that person and every single person that you talk, or you, and some that like a, a bunch of different things. And every single person that you talk to brings something to the party and just has so much to offer and it, it's just so interesting. So this program has just been really great for me. And I hope that uh, y'all, I hope it's the, the same for y'all too. And uh, I think Scott may have stepped out, but what I'd like to do is um, take a moment to introduce other members of the training committee that are here. So uh, Bobby Langone, would you stand up? Y'all been hearing from Bobby too, okay? Yeah. Bobby is our um, liaison essentially with y'all from the training committee. And you may notice he has the same last name as, as, as this lady over here, his wife, you know, <laughs> is our president. Then let's see, who else do we have here? We have our vice president, Darla. Darla's here, that's our vice president. Okay, Scott, um, Scott Ball is also on the training committee. And prior to this year, he was the training director for two years, three years. We had, <laughs> so, we, um, yeah, well, we kind of got coveted, and yeah. so that we kind of <laughs> took a little hiatus there. <laughs> uh, but then he, he got us back on track. Let's see. Uh, and then our IT guy is Val, but I, I don't think he's he's here today, right? So Bobby got us all hooked up up here. Yay! Thank you, because that's not me. <laughs> I, I will tell y'all that. Um, my, my gift is finding the right person for the job, and I know <laughs> this is not me. Um, I could manage a project to take over a small country, but, you know, <laughs> how computers work is totally not my thing. Um, let's see, who else do we have? Melissa? <laughs> Melissa here? Any other officers that are here that I missed? Okay. So, anyway, uh, welcome. I just talked to Carolyn one thing when I, oh, I eventually did go through the Master Gardener program in Walker County and I, I really love it. One thing that we had there was um, they made badges for us that had our pictures on there. And that was kind of, kind of unnecessary, I think, since we were uh, wearing a badge. But uh, anyway, <laughs> but, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but the thing that was cool about that was that they put, each badge like six of them on a piece of paper so you and then gave it to everybody and so that's what i want to do for y'all too because then what we're able to do 
was as somebody's talking, you can just look at it and figure out who it is. And so that's what I want to do for y'all too. And the trick for that is we need your headshots. Yeah. Okay, so I think Carolyn, do you have anything to say about that? Oh. Besides this. Yes, we have asked you to send a little headshot to put in our directory, and the directory is password protected. So you can include however you want to be contacted, whether it's through um, email or phone number or both. What we ask you to do is send a little picture of yourself. Please don't include your whole family. We just we want to be able to recognize you. When we're here in the class, we want to be able to look and say, oh yeah, that's so-and-so. I recognize them. They don't have a cap on and sunglasses like they're traveling incognito. Uh -huh. I can see their face clearly and I know who they are. So it's hard, especially going through COVID, it was really difficult for people to kind of get a feel for the rest of the class. Luckily for us, here we are. <laughs> so it'll be a little easier. This is the largest class we've ever hosted. Yes, the largest <laughs> class. <laughs> so, so we, you know, the technology we've been using for a year now, that doesn't mean it's not without it's every, every new venue we go to has its own little wrinkles that we have to kind of overcome. So we appreciate ahead of time. I want to thank you for your patience. If you're not patient, please step to the back of the room. <laughs> you can have whatever little hit the wall you need to get it out of your system. And then go back to this. Um, send your photos to heartwoodweb at gmail.com. As I said, that's a password protected page. Could you repeat that, please? Heartwood web w-e-b heartwood web at gmail.com one b one b heartwood web all orders so now email addresses don't even know now the password on the other hand now should i tell them the password i think well <laughs> we can trust them okay <laughs> 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 It'll be on the recording. Oh, I better write it. Um, yes, but not on the because that'll be on the recording. Yeah. What I'll do is y'all come up to me and I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, or you can email me. All right. Or, and I'll tell you. Where should I email? We'll find the telephone game and see if it lands up at the time. <laughs> okay. So it's a really easy password to remember. You can look at pictures. We have the, the year that people have graduated under their photo. So if you find, if you're looking for your classmates, it's gonna say 2022 20, at the bottom, okay? So we would like to kind of get that filled down. We have pictures from some of our um, more seasoned members. So when you're coming to the chapter meetings and people are speaking, you'll be able to tell who they are. We also have our board members there. So you'll be able to look at pictures and say, oh yeah, I recognize so and so. That's who does whatever. Okay. There's anything else I need to add? I don't think so. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna get going. Uh, Sarah Freeman just came in and she is our director of diversity or something. And uh, anyway, and we're going to, so you're going to have a guest speaker today. So in addition to our nine up here, Sarah's going to give you a uh, blurb on that. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Gwen Lanny, who is going to talk to us about uh, naturalists and the land ethic. Maybe. Is she getting coffee? <laughs> she's in my She's in my Okay. Yeah. Oh, Sarah. Okay. So it's it's kismet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be very quick because I'm actually gonna bike 20 miles after this. <laughs> I've got my light for on on video. So I am the diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, director, and we're basically here to give guidance and try and keep the chapter on track with any diversity, equity and inclusion issues. I also have, I can't see her, Anne. 
right in there, right in there. <laughs> Anne is the, I, I only had one coffee today. Yeah. <laughs> Anne is the new class rep and she is also on my committee. Yes. And she is going to be keeping keeping tabs on your no, no. No, she's not. No, she's not. Keeping tabs on me. Keeping tabs on me. She's gonna make sure that everything is running smoothly. And if anyone's got any issues, if it comes to anything that they're feeling excluded from or anything like that speak to Anne or speak to myself. We can try and make everyone feel as included as, as possible. Um, language, everything. Actually, I should have said this, my pronouns are she, her, just so everyone knows. Um, yeah, so we're in charge of diversity, equity, and inclusion. If you want to join the committee, we really need members. I'm looking at everyone here. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't really know what else to say on this, but yeah, I just thought I'd introduce Okay, myself. so what's your email? Good question. Uh, Heartwood diversity, or one word, at gmail.com. And reach out to me anytime. On the members page, there's also my cell number. Anyone can text me if you've got anything. Um, if anyone ever needs a lift to a meeting or anything, and you're in the woodlands, give us a shout. And also, I like bugs and water. Really? <laughs> Okay, one thing that had come up when we were talking, thank you, thank you, Sarah. Uh, one thing that had come up when we were uh, talking about diversity at one point was that um, one of last year's interns got up and said that it really helped her that these classes were on a Saturday because then she could, she was like me, you know, she could do it, but not because she had her full time job was being a stay at home mom and she had coverage on Saturday. And so it really helped her. And it really helped her that we went hybrid. And so that's one thing that, based on that, that we'll probably continue to do even after, you know, restrictions are completely lifted, is to offer that hybrid option. Uh, just because, again, for, for more inclusiveness. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, there are something to be said for getting to sit next to, next to your fellow interns and talk to them. And I mean, it's, it's, really great it's really great scott and i were in the same intern class and uh, so i think y'all i i hope i hope my hope for y'all is that you have as great a time doing it as we did fair enough okay all right when that's a tripping hazard. class of 2010. Our class met on Mondays and from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and we just did field trips in a van and there were 12 of us and I'm the only one left because people moved and stuff like that. So um, I'm going to talk about the history of naturalists in Texas long before there was a Texas master naturalist program. <laughs> Uh, I came up with this class. I'm part of the unit that goes over to Ellis unit. So this presentation was aimed at the people at Ellis. And so there's a lot of you that may know more than me about anything I talk about. So I hope it's okay. Which one do you want first? Uh, Texas Naturalist. Take a 
Bobby? What? On your phone, is it showing just this? What are you looking for? Is it showing just this on your screen? Yeah? Good. Okay. You go, Gordon. Go. Okay. <laughs> it's not going. It's not going. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I've seen it on that. Okay, good. It's it went on there, but it's not going on. Huh. Anyone feeling impatient? <laughs> yeah, we're ten minutes ahead of schedule. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I just figured it out. Um, I used to work at George Ranch for like 10 years, so I lived in the 1830s. And then I also got to be a seasonal uh, park ranger at Big Ben in 2006 and 2008. So that's kind of what history, nature background I have. Oh, that's it. Okay. The external display is. <coughs> okay. Let's pull this back out. Okay. Good. Pull this back out. But that's the wrong one. No, it's the right side. It's the right presentation. It's the wrong side. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yay. All right. Yay. Oh, Yay. Okay. Can y'all okay. yeah. hear me? Do that. Okay. All right. So. I'm going to start with we all have these memorable moments with nature, and that's why we're here. Uh, this is where I live. I live in the northwest part of Montgomery County on um, a farm that my husband's family bought 60 years ago. And so it's part hay, part timber, part cows. And this is a little path I take between my house and the barn. And when I would go up there every day to take care of my animals, just one day, the circle's in the wrong place. Off in the tree line, something just caught my eye. I was just like, that tree stump doesn't look right. If you'd asked me, I wouldn't have even told you, yes, there's a tree stump over there, but I just knew it was different. And I have learned to take my camera with me every day, every time I go anywhere. So I focused in and it turned out to be a young owl. <clears throat> And then over the next like two weeks, we kept seeing this young owl and its parents taking care of it and stuff. And so that was just a, a moment for me. And another time I got to go to High Oaks, to the rookery there. And if you've been there, it's like an island and then there's a waterway and then across the street, there's a big viewing station. And so we were there looking at the birds, the egrets and the spoonbills. And then a, a spoonbill just flew over right to us. And um, I used to live down in Fort Bend and I saw roseate spoonbills all the time, but I had never seen one this close. Mm. So those are the kind of encounters that we've all had where that makes us want to know more and have more experiences like that. <laughs> but looking at how the study of nature started in Texas, you know, we have to go back. And so I'm going to do for... Um, those of you who haven't lived in the 1830s, a little history background. This is a map from 1816. And if we zoom in, we can see that they, they weren't real accurate. They thought we had a lot of mountains here in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> We're all sad that they're young. Know. And um, of course, the first naturalists in Texas would have been the Native Americans, but they didn't write stuff down. And your book has an excellent chapter on the different groups and how they did things. So I'm not going to talk about that. Then when the Spaniards got here, 
they saw the Llano Estacado and they were like, well, there's no landmarks. You know, they're just looking for Cibolo. They're looking for the seven cities of gold. They really weren't that interested in the nature either. And then this is just, if you uh, need to remember when your six flags were, um, the manual focuses on, when I, when I started, there was literally 95 pages about the early naturalists of Texas. They mentioned everybody they thought that their grandchildren would be mad if they were left out. You know, they, did, they did everybody. But now I think it's much more reasonable in your section. And they're focusing on those whose extensive efforts provided a background, a, a foundation for what we know now. Carolyn, what did you do? Oh, no. I didn't see the slide. When I shared the screen, because they were seeing it, uh, oh. it messed us up. It can't, yeah, it's still on the first one there. You're going to have to just sit there and click. <laughs> you might have to say B. I know. Later on, that's going to be. Okay, that's, do you want to share it? Can we do. Yeah, I, and I did not make that, but yeah, there is there's some so much that's here. Oh, there goes. Is that, okay. Is that good? Is it working? Oh, it did. I clicked it. I don't know if you clicked it too. I clicked at the same time. Click. Yeah, you got it. Okay. Okay. But right. Are they still seeing it at home? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Adam. All right. And this is just again for reference. Like if you were curious, like, well, when were the Comanches here or whatever? Um, some of the years that were important in Texas history. But we're going to skip over that. The, the important thing is that as the political boundaries move, the scientific frontiers move with them. So we're going to start about 200 years ago. Um, and in 1815, Napoleon died. 1819, Alabama was the 22nd state. We have Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the Erie Canal. This is your cost of living. A frying pan is 68 cents. A 10 gallon kettle, 175. <laughs> I have since learned that shipping from New Orleans to New York was uh, 40 cents per cubic foot. And a dollar then is worth about $25 today. And if you were in 1827 in Philadelphia, this is what the ladies look like. Uh, as far as science, steamboats, in 1807, Robert Fulton's Clearmont went up the Hudson River as the first commercially viable steamboat. And then they don't know exactly, but by the 1830s, more than 1,200 steamboats were going up and down the Mississippi River. And all of the guys I'm going to talk about got here by steamboat uh, originally. Well, maybe not the first time. And then locomotives. I don't know if you've ever read any of the Discworld books. Uh, I think it's Steam is when they talk about the trains and they fictionalize all of this, that in 1829, this is a locomotive and they had a contest for it and it ran on a circular track and it was like a circus attraction. And here in the US, Baltimore and Ohio had 13 miles of track, but it was horse-drawn carts. So that's where we were with that. As far as health. When I first started putting this presentation together, this is showing like, this is an artist's rendition of what a pandemic was like. And I was like, oh, how quaint, how historic, you know? <laughs> and uh, 
then you know you live through it and you're like that's pretty darn accurate so <laughs> they still did not know for sure some people sort of had a germ theory but some people were like no it's just bad air and health issues affected most of the people who came here as naturalists so this world was pretty exciting you have industrial revolution you have you know napoleon you have everything and people around the world, institutions wanted to explore Texas. And so their solution was somebody like that. They just send some little naturalist with his magnifying glass and his knowledge. And when I first, I'm not much of a plant person. Don't listen, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't realize, even though I had experience in living in the 1830s, I didn't think about the fact that they really didn't have chemistry. Everything they used had to come from the natural world. Medicine, food, dye, uh, lubricating things, you know, whatever they needed, needed to come from plants, animals, and minerals. And so they were very, very interested in exploring and seeing what they could find. And even today, the collections that they made are so useful even today. Um, this is showing the herpetology collection at University of Texas. This is one of my favorites, a beetle mania exhibit at Harvard. Mammals, fish, they would just collect the whole thing. And this is one of the reasons that the actual physical specimens are so important. The ones on the left are from about 1900, 1916. The ones on the right are from 1970s. So what would have caused the difference? Why are those dirty? Same species? Same, exactly. There was coal fire, soot, you know, even around and um, here in the US. And if we just had photographs or drawings, we wouldn't know that. And this is another one that shows many different species and how they were so dark in the early 1900s. Now the logistics of being a naturalist, especially a botanist, were not that complicated. You did not need that much equipment. Um, the vasculum, the little box that you hold this the, your species, your samples in specimens. Uh, one of our guys that we're gonna talk about, Thomas Drummond, before he came to Texas, he was in Canada for two years in the Western Rockies. And he had this episode where he was with um, a brigade of people, but he was exploring ahead of them. He had seen a moss in a riverbank the day before and he wanted to go back and get it. So he went off by himself. And as he was collecting it, he startled some bears. So the baby bears run off in one direction and mama bear starts charging him. And he's like, okay, I have bird shot in my gun. So he's taking out the bird shot and putting in a ball because it was 1826. There's no, you know, modern weapons. And he goes to shoot at the bear and the gun misfires because it's wet. And so he's like, well, all I could do was take the gun, turn it around and hit her in the head with the butt end of the gun. And that didn't really work that well. <laughs> and then the brigade came up, the dogs came first and he was like, yay. But then the dog saw the bear and ran away. <laughs> and then the brigade comes up on horseback and he said they had six weapons between them, but they were all so shocked. Nobody could get their weapon ready to fire and the bear escaped. So he found that later he used the vasculum to just rattle and shake up, scare off bears. And he also said, I was not prevented from collecting my sample. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what they wanted. I mean, they had specialized paper for, draw, for drawing the plant samples and then they would have paper to mount them on and they had to carry all these things. And of course, there's no plastic. We're still talking about wooden kegs, glass bottles, a glass bottle of ether, you know, all this kind of thing. 
This is a sample from one of the guys we're going to talk about. This is a cochineal, which is little bugs that live on prickly pear cactus and make a beautiful red dye, which was one of the products that they were looking for. Like, can we, um, you know, benefit from this territory that we have? But so he's got to make his own ink, you know, to write his label and he's got to keep it in a glass jar. And then like we have these lovely guidebooks where we can go, I see a red flower. Let me look at, see if I can find it in the guidebook. Or of course we have iNaturalist, but their books, this is one that, that one of the guys brought with him. And it looked like this. There were out of 354 pages, there were like 28 color plates. You just had to read it. You had to know it. Okay. And then, so this is my place. And if you're looking at this little creek, to me, these plants all look very, very similar. Those guys had to know, are those different plants? Is that the same plant I picked up yesterday? Have I dried that plant? Is this a new species? And they had to make those decisions as they were walking around 20 miles a day through unknown territory. And then they would dry the samples and put them in a plant press. And that's not you know, too terrible until you have a lot of those and you're traveling like that and you have no room. And then also you're on unknown territory. Um, you could camp in a lovely place like this. And then in the morning you wake up and that's what has happened. And it didn't even rain by you, it rained upstream somewhere. So they had constant battles with keeping their specimens. Then you have the problem of lots of mammals are gonna get out of your way. You're not gonna see the mammals and you're not gonna see mammals that are flying around at night. This is, uh, this is our family's other place. And these are the creatures that are still there. <laughs> Where is that? Uh, Rock Springs. So Edwards County, kind of close to Del Rio. There's still elk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty good at Photoshop. <laughs> so, you know, these guys, they were traveling through. Like, I have, you know, game cameras and I look at thousands of pictures every year and see what has been gathered by remote camera trap. But they didn't have that ability. They couldn't just sit there and wait until something came along. So sometimes they would hire locals if there were locals to trap or shoot for them so they could have the skins. And then of course you can look for the evidence, the feathers, the bones, the nests, the holes, the burrows. Um, these are turtle eggs that I found after some other critter found them. <laughs> Tracks, sheds, Oop. Okay, so now that we're back in 1816, we're gonna start talking about individuals. Does anybody have any questions before I? Okay. This guy, Jean-Louis Berlandier uh, was born in France. A lot of these guys fit a pattern of being educated either in Europe or the Eastern United States and coming here with an institution. So I think the first three guys we're going to talk about, that was their pattern. He was someone that they they seem like they it was always like the people. Yeah, go ahead. What do you want us to get out of this, both the reading and what you're talking? What should we be remembering? Or what should we for me? It's like to show you, and um, when I get to the rest of it too, that the broad options you have to follow your own path through master naturalists and see what you want to have. So kind of for me, an appreciation of these guys, some of them, there's still no books written about them. There's still no movies. Um, an appreciation of what people had to go through before us 
so and maybe see in some place you want to build on what they did or follow your own and just see all the options that are available to you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these guys, wherever they were, wherever they were studying, somebody, an expedition would come up and their, their cohort would say to them like, you need to be the guy to go do that. You're not fitting in here. Why don't you try Texas? <laughs> <laughs> so he was one to send, and these are drawings that he did. This is a drawing that he did. And he was sent by somebody very well respected in Switzerland, De Kandel, which I could be saying wrong, I don't know. He sent back 55,000 plant specimens. But uh, he ended up getting malaria. He was, if you know, like uh, where I live, kind of by Dobbin you know, <laughs> kind of by Anderson, kind of by Richards, but the, I go by Holland Creek all the time and he was there. He got a malaria and ended up getting sent back pretty early on. So he sent back to Switzerland 55,000 specimens of 2,320 different plants. But the guy in Switzerland is like, meh, he didn't really do that great of a job. So he heard about that and he stayed here the rest of his life and he became a doctor. These are some of the things, okay, so this is, well, this is a plant sample of his, and it says, collected between Laredo and Bayar. So, all right, one of the lessons I would like you to get is if you collect a plant specimen, please give a better location than that. <laughs> That's really not that hot. And then this plant is named for him, the Texas Green Eyes. This is one of his drawings. So he stayed here, um, he married a Mexican woman, they had kids, he died crossing a flooded river. And his collection, which I'm gonna, uh, was just phenomenal, his widow hung on to it and fortunately uh, an army officer bought it from her. He bargained her down to $500 and then he turned around and sold it to the Smithsonian. So they still have it. But unlike, everything else, they have not digitized much of it. He was interested in the Indians. He went out hunting for 16 days and he also interviewed someone who had spent a long, long time working with the Comanches and he got, he wrote about them, their habits and everything. These are all the things he had notes on. The sky, the weather, the stars, the meteorological data. And so it's very valuable to us now. He was down in Matamoros and, you know, there's not a whole lot of that information on record except for what he wrote in the 1820s. Uh -huh. What language did he write? He wrote in French, Spanish. I don't think he ever wrote in English. Uh, some of his things have been translated into English, but I mean, he took, he, and you can still read his handwriting. And I'm gonna talk about the sources too, okay? And these are some of the things that were named for him. The Rio Grande Leopard Frog, the Texas Tortoise, which was, I think, just on the Facebook page. So the lady that's studying was asking if, if anybody sees these to let her know. All right, so now we're gonna move forward a little bit. And this is 1833, this is, Mary Austin Holly's map and she shows who owns which league. So if you don't own like 40,000 square miles of Texas, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, back then they did. So this is Thomas Drummond and he's the one I was talking about that was in Canada. This guy, we don't know much about his early life. He was from Scotland. In Canada, he stayed there for two years. He overwintered in a brush hut sometimes by himself, sometimes he would have an Indian guide. Um, they had one time where they were, they took a shortcut or they thought it was a shortcut and they had snow blindness and they couldn't hunt and he had to feed the sled dogs his samples of skins that he had saved for collections to send back to Europe. And he was like, well, you know, it was a good thing that I was, didn't, take all the flesh off the skins like I should have. <laughs> they ate a skunk. Mm -hmm. you know. 
But when he got here, it was like the worst of all possible years. It was 1833. First of all, we had the cholera, which um, had started like in 1829 in India and had moved around the world on the trade zone. So it took a long time to get here. And when he got here, it also, it was a huge flooding year. They called it the great overflow. So he was down in the, like Galveston, Velasco, Brazoria, and he got everywhere like by boat because the prairies were so flooded that the boats could run on the prairie. But then of course his vegetation samples he couldn't collect and what samples he had got wrecked and he had he was not real happy so oh oh. I missed a slide. um the cholera he was he was in Velasco he went up there on a boat and it struck and there were four houses in Velasco, one house was untouched, but the captain of the boat, the captain's sister who was on the boat and, and seven other people all died of cholera within 12 hours. And Thomas Drummond got it. And he said that he, he had such leg cramps that he dosed himself with opium and he said that that saved him, which I don't know why. Um, he, his face swelled up, his legs swelled up. He had no appetite for days. And then when he finally, did want to eat again, cholera had struck so many people that there was like nobody who you could buy a meal from. There was no pioneer woman around cooking cornbread. You know, people were either dead, recovering or something. So he hated Texas. And that's what I'm saying. <laughs> my slide. He, he, he wrote back to Thomas Hooker in Glasgow, who was his patron. And he said, well, it may interest you to know that these bird skins I sent you were all, you know, processed with a two cent pen knife. And I couldn't even keep that. If I set it down, somebody would steal it. <laughs> you know, like these people in Texas, you know, and he was not a whiny guy, but he, he didn't like it. But then he did say later that he wanted to come back here because with $150, he could buy a league of land and like 10 cows and he would be more independent here than he could ever hope to be in Europe. But sadly, he died of malaria, I think, in uh, 1833 in Cuba. And this, I just love this. This is the little onion flowers that kids bring you. And it's named for him. And it's like, he complained about everything. And he got a little stinky flower. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Charles Wright. And uh, he was another one that had a lot of difficulty. And he is from the Eastern United States. And he came here and first he taught at a college in Reutersville, which I've been through Reutersville and it still looks like it did in 1837 or something. So he again was kind of an oddball. He um, didn't really fit in that much, but he was collecting specimens and somebody suggested, well, why don't you send them to Asa Gray of Harvard? Asa Gray wanted to have like the world's best plant collection. So this is 1844. This is what Harvard looked like in 1844. And you know, Texas was pretty bleak at that time. So uh, Asa Gray gets Charles Wright a position on a boundary commission. Uh, and they make the agreement that the military will transport his samples, but they make no agreement for him to eat. And so he has to walk from San Antonio to El Paso. And the whole time there's all his letters to Asa Gray still exist, you know, show you. And um, the whole time it's like, well, the officers won't let me eat with them because they say they would have to do that for everybody. <laughs> and the, the enlisted men won't let me eat with them because they're mad they have to haul my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, some contemporary art. This was by a woman who was here in 1852. Um, so that shows the Guadalupe at Seguin and the how you get across. And that shows San Antonio in 1852. So this is when he's leaving San Antonio. This is some, that's a Channel Rock, Cardinalis. This um, 
if you look this one up yourself, it's very, very faint. I photoshopped it a lot so you could see it, but that's what a camp would have looked like when he was camping with these guys. And that's the kind of territory he went through. He went all the way to El Paso, that's in Big Ben, but. So there's one of his letters and there's the campfire. Um, what he finally ended up doing, all his letters are like, okay, they finally let me eat with one of the messes, but then the cook had to be fired because he swore all the time. And then nobody would let me eat with them. And then I found a doctor and he said he had food. He would let me share his food if I did all the cooking. But he complained so much about my cooking, I'm never speaking to him again. <laughs> <laughs> and he, his thing was, he, oh, he was always saying, if you would just give me a wagon and a mule, I would go by myself and I could do this better. But these people that are loading, and that was the same thing Thomas Drummond had found, where the motto of his patron was, every scholar adds to the empire. You know, whatever knowledge we can get is beneficial, but the people that he was running into in Texas were like, if it wasn't for your stupid stuff, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have as much work to do. So Golden Rod is named for Charles Wright, Rod Titsi. Now these guys, the, the next ones, they did not follow this pattern of being educated somewhere and working with an institution. They were more independent and you know, there, there's information about them in your book, but like this is one of the uh, insect collections of Hylogrope. And these people, a lot of times would, they were freelancers. They would go out and collect and have an agreement that for a hundred specimens mounted and labeled, they were gonna get $8 from some institution back east. And uh, like one of the guys, when he died, you know, he had whatever his um, estate was, nine tenths of the value was his books and the rest was just a little bit of furniture and stuff. Gideon Lincecum was rare in, uh, in this bunch is that uh, he was from, oh, I'm sorry, I get him and Lindheimer. Uh, okay, yeah, this is the right one. He was from, I believe, Georgia and came here and he was known for his thorough observations. He just picked one thing pretty much. He liked ants a lot. And he really observed them and corresponded with Darwin. When we read his observations, we like, he anthropomorphized a lot. He was like, the superior ant looks at the ones at the trap that are trapped and he marches off to <laughs> start a new colony or something. But, you know, still he was so interested. And then Jacob Lindheimer was one that was in Germany as a professor and they had a lot of political uprisings. He and a lot of people came to the US and he uh, did get a wagon where he would go off on his own for sometimes months. He just had a gun, a couple of dogs and he would just go out and collect. So he was living the dream that the other guys had helped for. And he's known for the prickly pear that we named it. So now 1891, railroads are crossing Texas. It's all pretty modern. And this lady is not in your book, but she was in my book. So that's where I learned about her and seeing that I spent time out there. This is Mary Sophie Young. And she grew up her, she had older brothers and she wanted to go with them on their adventures. And she promised she would never hold them back. So she learned to just camp all day, drink out of a stock tank, eat a prickly pear fruit, keep going. And so she was a professor at University of Texas. And in a couple of summers in 1914 and 1915, I think, um, she went out to the Big Bend area and collected out there. And of course it wasn't proper for a woman to travel by herself. So Benjamin Tharp sent his younger brother, Carrie with her. She was like, 42 or 52 and Carrie was like 19 and he needed to focus on his studies. So they're like, okay, he's gonna study math while you wander around and um, collect plants all day. And so they got a couple, by this time even, it's 1914, she has no idea how to run burrows or anything, but she gets a couple and her book, she kept a, a journal and it was all republished 50 years after she went. 
It's pretty funny. So she started out from Marfa. And this is the view from the Marfa courthouse. So this is what she was walking in. And she went to all these areas. She walked around. Again, this is what she was doing. She would just take off and sometimes she'd find the wrong canyon and get home late. They were staying in the ruins of ranch houses and trying to buy beans and stuff from ranchers. That's one of her. So her, her whole journal is, now I will caution you, she, she does make a couple of mildly racist statements, but it was 1914 and she didn't know her journal was ever going to be published. But overall, it's pretty funny. Uh, we had to eat jackrabbit. It gives you exercise to eat jackrabbit. <laughs> if we if we boil, the, we can chew the juice. <laughs> so it also at this time, oh, you know, getting from the kind of an expanding field, which Mary Sophie Young represents that now women could be out getting published and stuff. Um, I, all the ones I've talked about so far, I have no idea what their attitude was about resources. If they were like, I don't care if the government comes in and takes every last cactus we have and turns it into wood pulp or something. I don't know what if they cared about conservation, but this next lady really seriously did. So the feather trade, was just horrendous. People were killing. Like they would go to a rookery like this and they didn't even think, okay, it's nesting season. Let me wait till the fledglings can fly. Then I'll take the parents, but next year there'll be more birds. They just cleared out. They just get them all. And um, this illustration shows some of the birds that were definitely in danger of being extinct. And so Florence uh, Miriam Bailey yeah, came along and she was the first one to really popularize watching birds instead of like sticking them on your hat. You know, if you say you like a bird, you don't really need it on your hat. And she had some books, Birds Through the Opera Glass because people didn't have binoculars yet. And this was her guidebook where you could look up, well, it's mostly blue, it's mostly red, and start flipping through that way instead of having to know the Latin terminology or something like that. So that brings us, you know, to our modern um, view of Texas as having all the different eco-regions. And for me, you know, what we're here for is to speak for those who can't speak for themselves. These are my sources. I, I mean, if, oh, yeah, let me get, okay. This book here, The Naturalist on the Frontier, which has a pathetic cover, it's available through Kindle for, I don't know, $11 or something. So this was from written like in 1940. Uh, Samuel Lloyd Geyser had put together articles for Southwest Historical quarterly for a decade. And he's, I read that book every year. It's kind of wordy, but he's responsible for collecting a lot of information on these guys. Um, Berlandier, the one who came from Switzerland, this guy, Russell Lawson, just wrote a book about him, but he essentially just took Berlandier's journals and kind of restates it. And like every other page, it's like, oh, he said it reminded him of Switzerland. Oh, he was homesick. And it didn't give anything like his modern significance. I was really disappointed in that book, but it's at the library. And then the rural Texas landowners is just more, I think about like the kind of area that they would have passed through. The original, I go back and read the, primary sources, and it's all on archive.com. Um, like I said, Berlandier doesn't have much out there, but Charles Wright, all of his, and I'm actually transcribing it and reading the letters. It's never been typed up that Carolyn and Harvard could find. So um, 
<clears throat> Thomas Drummond has all been typed up, I think, by people. And Mary Sophie is all, that's all available online too. So, I need to go to my office. So do you have any questions? I'm gonna go on with the other. Anybody have anything? Some of the other chat questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Is, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Alien, Alien. Uh -huh. So what was the gentleman's name? Thomas Drummond. So I really liked, I'm so sad that my, his slide where he was so itchy <laughs> is gone, but I, and I would love to do it with a Scottish accent, you know. But. Mary Austin something. Mary Austin, Holly. Holly? Yeah, I think that's Stephen F. Austin's sister. I wondered about that Austin. Yeah. Story. And what did she do? She, she wrote books of the history of Texas, and she mentioned Thomas Drummond in one of her books. She was very kind. She was like, he wasn't happy here, but he wanted to come back. I'm sure if he had just come another year, things would have worked out and he would have liked it. But, and I think she just wrote an early history of Texas. Some of our other chapters are named for getting homesick. Mm -hmm. And the comments. I love the pictures. Mm -hmm. the game camera. Not game cameras. Uh, awesome. That's all we do. We go up. We don't have TV up there. We just look at the game camera pictures. <laughs> and I don't know. Um, the ones that I focused on seem like they were on boundary commissions. You know, they were um, trying to establish where the boundary was, well, like Mexico. after the, uh-huh. Well, bad. one was Mexico and Spain, I think, the 1829. And then 1849 was U.S. and Mexico. But I mean, they went right across the middle of Texas, so, so I don't know why yeah, they so would have thought that was the boundary. Would probably be around that time. That would be more in what was then native territory. So yeah. That would be not only dangerous across, but there wouldn't be much motivation to survey a place like that since it's mostly just flat and rare. But eight Texas all the way up Exactly. Yeah. Then you reach the Rockies and just like, oh, yeah. There were. Um, okay, some of the pictures that I used were from the McNay Museum in San Antonio, the Ammon Carter in Fort Worth, and I think the Ammon Carter has a lot of pictures of somebody who was going through the Panhandle to New Mexico and Colorado. You know, lots of contemporaneous contemporaneous artwork, but I didn't use it because it didn't cover these guys, but that's some place where you could maybe look as the Ammon Carter. I would think the East Texas portion would be explored for timber. Right? Well, yeah, and then, you know, the big thicket was like an outlaw area, you know, like you just didn't go in there. Gwen, uh -huh. 
do you think it's fair to say that all of the uh, early uh, naturalist exploration was politically motivated? Well, that we know of, that they wrote records for. Um, like Charles Wright, he was writing these letters to Asa Gray asking for constantly more resources. But, so he wrote, like he left San Antonio, I think May, May 1st or something, and wrote up until about July 19th when he was south of Vivaldi, and then didn't write again until he got back home because he had to wait when there was going to be a wagon train going that could bring the letter. And then when he got back to San Antonio in December, he wrote, well, let me tell you more about what happened. You know, so, and, but the soldiers, the officers he was on with Captain French, they kept actual documentation and it got printed. It's in reports to Congress. You can, it's all beautifully typeset. Um, and one of the things I'm trying to do is map where he was. Like, you know, one of the things I found out, like where I have my place is between the Nueces and the Devil's River. Well, they also called the Devil's River the San Pedro. So if I was just reading those notes, I'd be like, San Pedro, where is that? You know, um, so trying to figure out the location, like they may talk about a creek that's not there anymore, it dried up or it's not that easy, but if I can put all that information together, I should like know spot by spot where they were. Um, but then, you know, probably like Berlandier, years and years of his notes, maybe somebody else did that and the widow didn't know and threw it away or something. And of course, you know, like we talk about inclusion, I am so sad that we don't have more memoirs from all kinds of ethnicities and women and stuff. Um, I would love to do like an oral history project like that when I go to Ellis unit and talk to those guys about what they've learned from their grandmothers or whatever, but you know, you limited time. You want to talk about the Ellis unit? Well, I, are you gonna talk about Ellis later? Okay. You can do it. Okay. How, how long have we been doing it? You did a year before I started. You, you should, Scott started, he wanted to, am I, is it not working? I can tell us what you do with it. Yeah, well, it's not working right. Okay, so we're. I need to tell us. You need to tell us. You need to tell us, yeah. You need to tell us. I use my papers. I was doing that. Oh, we can. And I'll get a sip of water. So consider this a commercial while we're <laughs> so she when she's talking about the Ellis unit, you may want to know what that is. So just as a, a starter, Lisa and I were in the same intern class like all of you five years ago. The year after we graduated, I got involved in a Lake Livingston Conservation Project called Friends of Lake Livingston. And it involves a whole bunch of high schools around the south in a lake where they're doing aquatic habitat restoration. So the short story is, is that students uh, go home for the summer, but they don't, you know, we were trying to get the schools to do conservation, but they were growing the plants that go on the lake and they would die in the winter, they get frozen, the kids would go home, and we needed a way to propagate those plants. We accidentally got hooked up with the Lee College Horticulture Instruction Program that's in the Ellis Unit, northeast of Huntsville. That's a maximum security prison. I went and visited there, and I wore a shirt, just like Lisa Tuck. She's going to be our model today. <laughs> and my friend Scooter Langley, who's uh, a young man in about his mid low 40s, I guess, he says, oh, you're going to have trouble because they're going to want to know what that is. And so we were there just to get them to help us grow plants over the winter. And they said, what's this master naturalist thing? And long story short, they want to do what you're doing right here. They wanted to train and become master naturalist in a maximum security prison. We went, oh, hell, now what are you doing? <laughs> so I called, I, I called the training instructor. We had to contact the state. And a long story short, we started a training program for these guys. They can't volunteer like all of you are going to volunteer. They can't. They don't have the internet. 
They don't have cell phones, even though the last time they had a lockdown, they found 44 inside the prison. <laughs> what did they say they sell for like $1,600? Yeah, <laughs> 3000 <laughs> Uh, the correctional officers don't get paid very much, so you can imagine how the cell phones get into the prison so they get paid outside of prison. That's another, there's lots of stories. <laughs> Stuff happens in prison. But <laughs> the good news is, is that we now, we're the only chapter in the state that is doing this, uh, at least until last year. Now the Brazos Valley chapter out of College Station is doing it at the Navasota unit, also tied to Lee College. So the trick is we're connected to the Lee College Horticulture System, which does associate degree horticulture programs for inmates. The guys get the same instruction you're gonna get and it's woven into their horticulture curriculum. 80% of the instructors that go to the unit are from Hartwood. When goes, Bobby refuses to go because he's a chicken. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist it. He's a fellow oil and gas refugee, so we give each other. But his wife, Carolyn, goes and does entomology. And so we, we've had lots of Hartwood members that go into this situation, which admittedly is intimidating sometimes or challenging. The rewards are Incredible. Unbelievable. I was a teacher for years, and this is the best audience you would ever want yeah, to teach. Absolutely. Yeah. They are. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's not what you think. And everybody, there's 25 people in a class. Uh, Hartwood's has to sponsor this by state uh, guidance. Mary Pearl Muth, who you've heard her name, she comes and attends the graduation every year. So at some point in your education, if you'd like to participate in this program, this is your shot to get in prison. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, and Carolyn graciously in the newsletter, we're going to have an article on the program in the graduating class so you can see what it looks like. So be looking for the next newsletter. Yeah. So that's timely. So that's your story for the day. But I think we're going to continue doing it because the guys really, it's rewarding for us more than for them. Does it work now? So yeah. So? yeah. <laughs> one, one last pause. Uh, can someone online try to ask a question? Unmute. Is it verbally or question. by chat? I don't see verbally. I'm getting their chats. They they all said great presentation. Oh, Thank nice. you. And I want to pass that on, but I wanted to see if they can talk. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so with finishing up the naturalists, like I hope you just get an appreciation for what they went through and then seeing that toward the end of that time, they were going from just strictly studying to stepping into conservation and activism and conservation is where we come in. The actual official mission is to develop a core of well-informed volunteers to provide education, outreach and service dedicated to the beneficial management of natural resources and natural areas within their communities for the state of Texas. That's my other place. That's my place in the whole country. Oh, wow. So beneficial land management practices look different in the different regions of Texas and for what uh, your objective is. But I think we can all agree that that is not beneficial land management. This one in uh, across the street from me where I live in Montgomery County, somebody bought a, a thin strip of seven acres along the road and they immediately clear cut it and scraped all the soil and dug trenches. And the only reason any of those trees are still there is because that was the neighboring property. So it's East Texas, so people are a little nosy. So a neighbor went over and said, well, what are you gonna do here? And they said, well, we are, um, a pipeline clearing company and we're going to bring all the trash from different pipelines here and burn it in these trenches 24 7. Oh. so we got together and had a little meeting and what they didn't know is that on our street we had two environmental consultants and a fire marshal <laughs> <laughs> and they pointed out that in texas it is not legal to burn anything from any other property it has to be the property where like if your tree falls down you can't bring it somewhere else there would be permitting and things like that so then the people sold it <laughs> to some poor people i mean 
I felt sorry for the next people. They were like everywhere. They, they, it was a little family and they wanted to set up three trailers on it. And they said, everywhere we try to put the foundation for the trailer, there's like logs under the soil. <laughs> so Texas is, you know, and you're going to hear this over and over. 95% of Texas is in private land. So if we want to conserve, we have to affect the private landowners. And um, the rural population is only 10% of the Texas population and the landowning population is less than 1% of, of the overall population. But if you, I have, I'm so lucky because I always wanted to have a place in the country and I'm glad that I do, but if you don't, you can still do so much. You can um, help people manage their land and work with parks and we'll get to all of that. So the two basic goals are diversity. You want a variety of species and variety within species to have a healthy property and sustainability. You wanna use a resource without depleting or permanently damaging it. So this is my place. We have a big hay pasture, a little cow pasture, and timber. So I am the opposite of all these naturalist people I spoke to you about. I don't go anywhere. I stay on my place and I walk about a mile loop every day for about an hour. And then I Photoshop at night to see what pictures I got. You know, they trans traversed Texas and they were uncomfortable and they faced floods and illness and I stay in my little place and I do what I'm comfortable doing. So within the master naturalist, there's room for this huge person. What am I, what's the word I'm looking for? Spectrum. Spectrum, thank you. So uh, the more modern person, the, like the, the Bible of conservation was Aldo Leopold and he was pointing out that we don't have to necessarily change the tools that we have traditionally used for survival, um, we have to change the way we use them. And what Texas Parks and Wildlife points out is that land management is important, not just oh, because it's a nice idea, but because if the land is managed properly, it helps it get through the stresses. We probably all remember the wildfires in 2011, you know, floods, 2017, if the land is taken care of, it can deal with these stresses and continue on. And land that is taken care of upstream of the urban areas can provide water and a lack of you know, flooding and stuff for the areas downstream. It helps all of us. We abuse land because we see it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we may belong, we may use it with love and respect. The role of Texas master naturalists is to begin their studies of the natural world found here in Texas and continue their study of nature by delving into these elements, all while keeping in mind the interconnectedness of the natural world. So like your question, you know, you pick your study, you pick what you like. Keep in mind that it's interconnected to everything, but you don't have to know everything. You just have to know the parts you like. And I like this, this lyric. I know the smallest voices, they can make it major. You don't know what's important, it's all important. So I'm gonna take you through the year on my place real quickly, just um, again, to kind of, they have to do presentations, right? Yeah. To maybe give you an idea, something that will spark your interest of a presentation of area you want to research. So in January, we have our year round residents. And then there's seasonal <laughs> residents and migrants come through. These are common grackles. They come in a big flock and they're only there for a day or two. Sometimes you have eruptions. This is pine siskin. They're not here every year. They're here some years. And then not, I, I have a very broad, but very, very shallow knowledge. I kind of know the names of the species. I have to relook, but noticing their adaptations like 
this bird has backwards toes compared to most birds so that it can cling to the tree better. I just like this one. They're just preaching to the turtles. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we are gathered here together. Little bunny. Um, this is a juvenile. They used to call it an Eastern yellow bellied racer, and now I believe they're just calling them Eastern racers. Mm -hmm. I just like to, again, like just the, the smallest creature when you look at it in depth and you see all the detail and, you know, their scales and all the adaptations they have so that they can survive. February, we always have these woodpecker wars in February. <laughs> this was snowpocalypse. Somebody pointed out to me that robins always space themselves evenly on branches. I don't know. <laughs> and just a butterfly, you know, open and close when it's camouflaged and when you see the other side. It's like his antenna. They're like Dr. Seuss creatures. Um, before I lived, well, I was, this place has been in my husband's family for 60 years, but I came up full time 15 <coughs> years ago and I didn't know there was more than one kind of dragonfly. <coughs> but I've gotten 19 different ones just on my place. Mm -hmm. This is tiny little skink. Are you see it in the, if you're a snake averse person and these rattle through the leaves, you're like, oh no, but it's just a tiny, tiny little lizard. Now, some things, we had otters in 2011 and I just had otters again this year, but for like one day and then they move on. And so, we have about a one acre pond and some other people around us have ponds. I've never seen an otter on the road. I mean, I just can't imagine how they travel between them. And I don't know where they go in between. This bird, that one swallowed that fish. This, this is, um, I think it was Ken, who would always talk about, you follow your questions. I had never seen a screech owl in the wild before, and one was in a tree, and it was a big hole. And when you see the little tufts sticking up, it just looks like bark. And so I was like, is that why they have those tufts? It's camouflaged? I don't know. When they fly out, they can flatten them, you know, so... This one, um, two years ago during the lockdown, they started letting you do city nature challenge from home. And so I went out every day for about an hour and this insect literally fell on my head and it's a Texas goldsmith beetle. And so it is currently considered an invertebrate species of concern. They don't know if they're endangered or not, but that's what walking around, it could be that they're everywhere and people just don't look. Or you see it and you go, it's a June bug, it's a chafer. Um, and so to me, just walking around and documenting these things and then putting the records in eBird or iNaturalist where scientists can look at them is a great contribution and it's easy to do. Oh, these are the robber flies and I love them because they try to hang around and look like they're not doing anything. <laughs> Here, 
sucking bugs dry. <laughs> I have chickens, so rat snakes show up a lot. <laughs> These Carolina wrens nested in our smoker, and I was like, oh, this is not going to turn out well. <laughs> they were fine. <laughs> I love the crawfish, though. So if they see me, they're like, I want a piece of you. <laughs> Does anybody know what the one on the left is? That's a leadless king, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. it's, a, it's a salamander. It's called a siren. Mm -hmm. And like they never complete metamorphosis. They only have two legs. Mm -hmm. And then these little muscles, I see the shells, the birds get them. And, you know, they're a good uh, freshwater indicator, but that's all I know about them. Oh, Lord. Box turtles can spend their whole life living in an acre. Oh my gosh. So my dogs help me. They find stuff I didn't notice. They're always spotting the turtles. Another different router fly. I love he's got like a skull on his back. But can I ask when you take these pictures, do you have like an actual camera or do you use your phone? I, I do have a camera. Okay. I'm a very late technology adopter. I might get better results with the phone. And I'll show the at the end of the camera. So the dragonfly, this is the nymph. And then they can hatch out. This is a wolf spider and she's carrying her egg sac and then later oh, wow. the babies are on her back. That's crazy. <coughs> and you, is Terry going to talk about fungus? Yeah. yeah. I, that's one thing I have not learned to identify yet is any of the fungus. This is a Slowinski's corn snake. Looks like a rat snake, but it's got a different pattern on top of its head and underneath. This snake is only that big. <laughs> <laughs> Last year, for the first time, I found this snapping turtle in the yard. Two days later, I found this mud turtle. I didn't know there was such a thing as a mud turtle. I was like, I thought it was a small red-eared snapper, but it had like all these scars on it and stuff. And that's as big as they get, they're like four inches. This bug, I, I had I, one of my dogs had had an operation and he had to wear the e-collar for six weeks. And he kept bashing into my legs and I had sheep and goats at the time. And he kept scaring them and I was just done with everybody. And then this bug showed up on my chair. And I was like, thank you, universe. <laughs> and it doesn't even have a common name. Oh, wow. There's a crab spider there. Camouflage. Then we start seeing summer residents. Um, I think this is a flycatcher. I think they're here year round, but I don't see them that often. Just the battle scars on these are just amazing to me what they go through. And you know, butterflies are always missing parts of their wings. This one it just reminds me of a birthday cake. <laughs> Now this one is interesting because that bird never managed to get that fish down. And when I got it, it's a catfish. So our pond is over 60 years old and it was stocked with bluegill and bass. There should not be catfish in there, but there are. I 
I've only seen indigo buntings one year. Oh, I like this roadrunner and coyote together. <laughs> Their eyes. I'm always trying to get good pictures of their eyes. This, to me, this bird, like seeing it from an angle that you're not used to looking at it, uh, it just looks so goofy. It looks so different, but it's a great for parent. Cocoons are beautiful, so that's what hatched out of that their antenna. This is it's really called a spiny orb weaver, but I like to call it the dark mall spider. <laughs> <laughs> Now, for the people who are worried about snakes, I have stepped over so many copperheads in my life. They really, nobody wants to get you. My daughter stepped on one when she was four. It just kept on going. Uh -huh. Let me take a whole bunch of pictures of it. And I kind of left it alone. Yeah. yeah. They don't care. And then, of course, we have the issues of invasives. Yuck. Or, yeah. Owls come and go. I've heard the barred owl again this year, but I get, you know, some years I never hear an owl. This is another one where these are sandhill cranes flying over. And when I went to put it in eBird, I had to put it in, I had, you know, like it didn't come up in the list of birds that should be there. Mm -hmm. So it's another time that they, it didn't, the algorithm or whatever did not predict that they would be in my area, but I had the evidence. There's a catfish at night, they were sleeping. Mm -hmm. Hognose. This one year, I think this was 2011, I saw hognose all the time. These two were in the garden, they stayed there forever, and I have not seen them since. Oh, that's a juvenile. The grub, like we found the grub in the compost heap, we just keep it. This is how I know my husband still loves me. He just like, well, honey, I found a bug. <laughs> I think you've seen this one. So we kept it for a long time and it hatched into that. So I found out that nobody knows what a grub is going to hatch into until it hatches. Like there's still a lot. A land ethic then reflects the existence and ecological conscience. And this in turn reflects a convic conviction of individual responsibility for the health of the land. Health is the capacity of the land for self-renewal. Conservation is our effort to understand and preserve this capacity. So as far as the land ethic goes, you know, some people, I'm sure you're gonna see videos and stuff with Bamberger Ranch and things like that. Some people, get their land and they do 
God, we pulled on this one. <laughs> um, they do huge efforts to bring things back, to plant native species and all that. I don't do that. I go walk for an hour a day and I take my pictures and then I upload them to iNaturalist or something. There, there's just room. Any effort is a helpful effort. If you can help people figure out what they need to do at a park, or if you just have a little balcony and you put a nectaring plant for a butterfly on there, or you have a suburban yard and you leave a pile of leaves where it's okay for spiders to be, you know, it all helps. Um, and that's my point. So <laughs> I showed y'all a lot of species, but not everything. I mean, I've got 102 species, birds, blah, blah, blah. That's my camera. I, it's a digital bridge. I just take hundreds of pictures and keep the best ones. And this, this is just to show you, like if I, I was this far from those ibises and then I could zoom in that much. And then I just crop, I fix the color if I need to. And you have to end with a dragonfly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Yay! I do, but I thought like, if you have a break and you just want it on, I don't know if you want to or anything, or I don't know what y'all are doing next. There's Melissa's talking next, right? Melissa's talking next. Why don't we take a break?